So you're there in Matthew chapter 15, and uh, we're going to continue our study through the Ten Commandments. And we are on the Fifth Commandment, which is uh, honor thy father and thy mother. And uh, Matthew 15 here, at the very beginning of the chapter, I believe gives a really good, um, I guess, outlook on that commandment as far as what it's intended for. And obviously the Pharisees were uh, taking it uh, a different direction that uh, Jesus had to rebuke them for. Um, but go to Exodus chapter 20, and I just want you to see, obviously, that commandment stated. So this is the fifth commandment. So we already went through the first commandment, which is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second commandment, Thou shalt not make any graven image, uh, and thou shalt not bow down thyself unto it and worship it. Then there was, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And then we had to keep the Sabbath day, or uh, keep the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, sanctify it, right? And so we had that, that command with the Sabbath. And now we have honor thy father and thy mother. So in verse 12 here, so Exodus 20, verse 12, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the, the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Okay, go to Deuteronomy chapter 5, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. And so you'll see this as we go through here. You have Exodus 20, which is where uh, God spake these Ten Commandments to the, the elders and everybody. And then after that, if you remember, they're like, only speak to Moses. You know, basically, it's like, Moses, we want you to talk to God. We don't, we're afraid to hear anything else, right? Um, and then Deuteronomy 5 is retelling that story or retelling what those Ten Commandments are. In verse 16, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged and that it may be, go well with thee, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Okay, so you know it's basically stating, and what we're going to see here is that this is the first commandment with promise. Okay, it says that in the New Testament. Um, but I want to go through Matthew, go back to Matthew chapter fifteen, because I, I believe that what Jesus is, you know, basically he's ripping their face off for not keeping this commandment correctly. Um, but in turn, he's really showing you what it means. Okay, so. Honor thy father and thy mother, we would usually look at this and be like, okay, children, honor thy father and mother, like little kids that are in the house, which is definitely, you know, very applicable, right? But this doesn't just stop when you're in the home, okay? Now, this doesn't mean that, now, it doesn't mean that when you leave the home and, you know, you leave father and mother, cleave unto your wife, or you leave father and mother and cleave unto your husband, that you have to obey, okay, your father and mother, okay? But there's a difference between obeying your father and mother and honoring them. Okay, because I'm not under obedience to my parents right now. Okay, you know I'm in, I'm you know have my own family and I'm leading over that family. But it does not mean that I don't honor my father and mother, at least try to, and that, that I should be doing that. Okay, so in verse one here of chapter 15, notice what it says. It says then then came Jesus uh, <clears throat> then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So we see here that. <laughs> that, you know, they're coming to him, and they're very clear that, hey, this is our tradition, right? They're not saying, you know, the Bible says this or anything like that. They're saying, you know, why are they transgressing our tradition, right? The tradition of the elders. And this is where you get into that Babylonian Talmud garbage, okay? The rabbinic uh, Talmud, which is the tradition of the elders, okay? So if you want to know what Jews uh, follow today, they follow what Jesus is rebuking right here, Okay? which is this tradition of the elders. And that's what that Talmud is. It's basically a bunch of rabbis talking about the Bible, and then they're adding on their own little stuff, or they're you know, giving their interpretation of it. And they cared way more about what the elders had to say, what their rabbis had to say, than what the Bible actually teaches. And they turn the Bible on its head most of the time. And that's what they do here. And Jesus is going to point this out, basically saying, you're literally making the Word of God a non effect by your tradition. Okay, and you're teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. And so I love this passage because it's Jesus ripping into the Pharisees um, and exposing their hypocrisy. But in verse 3 here it says, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So you see how he turned that, right? They're like, why are they transgressing the traditions of the fathers or the elders, right? And he's like, well, why are you transgressing the commandment of God by your tradition? So he's basically putting it on them. And he's going to give what he means or an example of that. Because really, when it comes to the washing of hands, he's like, who cares, right? That's pretty much what he gets to. He's like, you know, if you wash your hands, you don't wash your hands. That's not what's crucial here, okay? It's what's crucial is what's coming out of your mouth, you know, and he gets onto that later. But verse 4 there, it says, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, 
And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Now, I'm going to get to this in a little bit, but you see that there's two sides to this commandment. There's the honor. If you honor them, you're promised something. But if you do the opposite of that, you're promised. And so it's like you honor him, you're promised life. If you don't honor him, you're promised death, right? And, uh, and Jesus isn't denying that, by the way. Okay, I'm going to get to that, but he's not saying like, well, that was Old Testament. You know, he's just he's stating a fact. So if he's saying you need to honor your father and mother, then guess what? That if you curse father and mother, that should stand too with you know, let them die dead. You know, but I'm going to get into that in a minute. And verse five there it says, "But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. This have ye made." I'm sorry, thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And that's exactly what they're doing, right? They're basically making this like hand-washing thing a doctrine, okay? Meaning that this is something like you're not right with God if you don't do that, Okay. We need to all be careful of that, that we're not adding more you know, commandments to the Bible than it's actually there. Okay? That's where you get into standards and, and doubtful disputations, meaning that you say, well, I don't do this over here. I don't watch this. Okay, but don't teach that as a doctrine of the Bible. Okay? You, know, you can have that in your house as a doctrine or you know, a standard or whatever. Uh, or if it's washing hands, right? Let's say, you know, and we have a sign up that says wash your hands, you know, but... I'm not policing that. I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord, wash your hands, okay? Although the Bible does talk about putting your hands under uh, running water, okay? That sign says, don't be an idiot, wash your hands. No. What is, the thing is, though, that's not thus saith the Lord. There's no scripture underneath that. Do you notice that? And I'm not going to come down on you if you're going to be one of those people that doesn't wash your hands. I'm not going to be like, you know, saying you're not right with God or whatever, okay? But that being said, we don't just make up these doctrines and say, hey, you know, that's Bible, okay? Um, now, uh, what is it talking about, though? Well, in verse 5 there, it says, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. So what is he saying here? He's basically saying that anything that you do for your parents to honor them, it's not duty, it's profit. Do you understand what that means? Meaning the Bible, when it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that's not talking about like, hey, if you have time, you know, here's some extra credit, if you will, by honoring your father and mother. No, this is duty, meaning that if you don't keep this, there's going to be some hell to pay, if you, if you get, you know, in, for lack of better terms. Meaning that they're saying that it's a gift, meaning that if I honor my father and my mother, I'm doing you a service. You know, I'm doing above and beyond what I need to do, right? It's a gift. It's, you know, I'm profiting you. No, if I honor my father and my mother, I'm just being an unprofitable servant. You know, you kind of think of like, uh, you know, if you do what God commands you to do, right? What did Jesus say? Say unto them, I am an unprofitable servant. That doesn't mean that you're not an obedient servant and that you're not honoring him, right? What does profit mean? It means above and beyond, you know, that, uh, that break even, right? Meaning, if Jesus says, hey... I'll give you an example. Let's say Jesus was down here and says, hey, I need you to go soul winning one hour a week. Okay? One hour. Okay? Just for sake of argument, let's say he said that. And you go out an hour, just 59 minutes, 59 seconds, and, you know, like just to the T, 60, sec- 60 minutes, right? You're just to the T, you know, you're keeping that. You know what that is? That's unprofitable. That doesn't mean that you're not doing your duty, and it doesn't mean that you're not doing what you're told. Profit is above and beyond that. Okay, anybody that works and you know if uh, uh, you know you own a business or anything like that, profit is something where you know you have all your overhead paid, you have everything else paid, you're paying all the salaries, everything's paid for, and now this is all just extra. You know, so you want to be profitable, which is above and beyond what you need or what's required of you. Okay, so if you do what's required, that's not profitable. Okay. So you say, well, you know, how can we be profitable? Well, how about this? The Bible doesn't say. It says to, you know, give us this day our daily bread. It says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So you're supposed to be reading your Bible every day, but it doesn't give you an amount, does it? Okay. So you don't know if you're being profitable or not, but 
you know what, some people may be very profitable in that, meaning that they're going above and beyond, you know, what they need to be doing. Or it'll tell you to do certain things. You know, you think of like, um, you know, some will bear 30-fold, uh, 60-fold, 100-fold. What if you bear 200-fold? Right? Isn't that above and beyond what he was stating there? And that's where you get into the profitability. Now, what it's stating, though, is that honor thy father and mother is not about profit. It's not about, like, out of the goodness of your heart if you want to. No, this is a commandment that you must honor your father and mother, and this is not a gift. You're not giving them something. You're not giving them something they don't deserve. You know, what is a gift but something that you don't, it's not owed to you, okay? Salvation is a gift, right? It's not owed to you. It's something that you don't deserve, but you're taking as a gift, right? It's something that's uh, not... Uh, you're not indebted, right? What this is stating is that you are indebted to honor your father and your mother. And what are they doing? They're taking the opposite of that, saying, no, if you, uh, if you do this and say it's a gift, then you're free. You know? Basically, you don't have to honor your father and mother. If you do it, it's like above and beyond. Okay? That's what I believe he's stating there. But I believe he's really giving you a lot of information to say, hey, Honor thy father and mother. This is not something to just be like, well, should I do that? Or do I need to do that all the time? No, you need to do that all the time. Okay? And so it's not, you're not uh, doing them a favor. Okay? By honoring your father and mother. You're doing what you should be doing. Now, you may say, well, what if my parents aren't saved? I'll say this. Unless your parents are reprobate. Okay? Because you get into the idea of like, you know, loving your parents and all this other stuff. If your parents are twice dead, plucked up by the roots, and God hates them, okay, then, you know, that's the exception that proves the rule, meaning that you don't have to, like, do them honor, right? Give honor to whom honor is due. And so, barring that, okay, you know, then, you know, you need to be honoring your father and mother, whether they're saved or not. That doesn't mean that you need to be best friends with them. That doesn't mean that you have to talk to them all the time. But basically, when you're around them, you're respectful, and you're doing them honor, and you're not disrespecting them, you're not cursing them, you're just, you know, trying to do the best you can to honor them in every way that you can, okay? That doesn't mean that if they tell you to do something that's, that's wrong and sinful to do it, that's not what it means by honoring your father and mother, okay? Obviously, if God commands you to do it, it can't be sin, okay? So if your parents are telling you to do something that's sinful, then that's something where, obviously, you know, it, you you're not honoring your mother and father by doing something sinful for them, even if they command you to do it. Okay. But go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. So obviously this applies to children that are in the home, that you need to honor your father and your mother. And this is one that I tell my kids, you know, because... We talk about lying, why you shouldn't lie. And, and I'll tell them, I'll say, listen, the Bible says you need to honor your father and mother. That means that you need to obey us, right? You need to, you know, not uh, be nasty to us. You need to be nice to us, all this different stuff. And I say, that's what God commands, you know. And that's a higher authority, isn't it? You're going to say, hey, God wants you to do this, okay? And uh, in verse 1 here, and this is, has, has anyone read the, the Herb Meyer books? You know, I got the Herb Meyer book. Uh, Pastor Roger Jimenez, like, did a book or whatever. It's a turtle. Um, but anyway, we got the book, uh, the Herb Meyer book, and it's, uh, there's this poem. It talks about Ephesians 1 and 2, you know, to obey my parents and the Lord with a good attitude. It says Ephesians 6, 1 and, verses 1 and 2 or whatever. And it goes through this book, and my girls have memorized, you know, that, that poem or whatever. Um, and anyway, uh, this is the verses right here in verse 1. It says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And that's what we saw in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. It's talking about the fact that, hey, there's this promise attached to this, okay? That if you honor your father and mother, you're going to live long, you know, that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Because people will take this too far and be like, well, you know, this person was honoring their father and mother and then they died young. Therefore, that, you know, that the Bible's got an error, right? What this means really is that if you don't honor your mo- father and mother, then, then basically you're, you're not going to have that attachment of a promise there, okay? 
meaning that uh, this is kind of like your helping of getting your way to living a long time on the earth. And so, but it is promising it, but you got to understand that there are exceptions to the rule, okay? Meaning that there's certain things where God will allow someone uh, to die young, and it's not that they were like cursing their father and mother, okay? Um, but in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 15, I believe this gives some context because in chapter 8, it'll say something that uh, it, it'll just kind of help you understand this because especially when you see these promises like you do this and this will happen and it'd be like, well, in this one case over here, it didn't happen, okay? But by and large, this commandment is basically stating, hey, if you honor your father and mother, listen, that's going to you know, be with you to give you long days on the earth. But if you don't honor your father and mother, you might as well just start counting your days, Okay? In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 15, it says, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. So, you know, basically Solomon's saying, listen, I've, I've seen all kinds of stuff, right? And even in another uh, portion, I think it's in chapter, 11, chapter 10 or chapter 11, he's basically saying, I've seen servants riding upon, you know, um, horses and basically uh, princes walking. You know, and he's basically stating, like, I've seen kind of this stuff that's more of a, uh, almost seems like an oxymoron, right? It kind of seems like it's just backwards, okay? And, you know, this is where the Job's friends got it wrong, right? They're like, you know, what man being righteous ever perished, you know? And, and going into this idea that, hey, if you're, if you're righteous, nothing bad's going to happen to you. You know, you're just promised the, the, a bed of roses in life, okay? And, and he's basically saying here, hey, there's, there's a just man that's going to perish in his righteousness, meaning like, you know what, there, there are exceptions to that rule, to meaning like you could do all, cross all your T's, dot all your I's, and still something bad can happen, okay? And go to Ecclesiastes chapter 6, or chapter 8, I'm sorry, chapter 8. So you want to attach yourself to that promise and be like, listen, I want, to have, I want to live long in the earth. I better start honoring my father and mother. You need to attach yourself to that commandment because that's very true, meaning that if you're cursing your father and mother, you know, you're just waiting for the hand of God to come down on you. But if you want, and this is in any Christian's life, you should be saying, hey, what can I do to really get God's protection? You know, where God's going to have this hedge of protection about me to where he's not going to let things like this happen, Okay. And really, you need to look at, okay, well, there's some commandments that have some promise here. I need to honor my father and mother. But if I'm not doing that, you might as well just say, I'm not, I just don't want that hedge around me. Okay? But in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11, it says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, Yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. So he's basically saying, hey, listen, though these sinners, you know, they live long and they, they do this, you know, a hundred times, right? He's, he's still stating, listen, I know that those that fear the Lord, uh, you know, they're going to they're gonna do well. In verse 13 it says, but it shall not be well with the wicked, <clears throat> neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow because he feareth not before God. And in perspective, right? You know, someone can live 100 years twice told and be a wicked person, but they're going to be in hell for all eternity, okay? Meaning that he's talking about our days here are like a shadow, okay? But all that to say is that he's stating, listen, I've seen a just man that perishes in his righteousness, but that's not to just negate the fact that God is going to be with those that are keeping his commandments and he's going to be against those that are breaking his commandments. Does that make sense? Because you can always find that exception somewhere where you're like, well, what about this guy? You know, what about that? Well, you know, and a lot of times it says that he has set them in slippery places, meaning that they look like they're prospering, but they're, they're, sudden destruction will come upon them. And you see this a lot of times, especially with celebrities, right? Like, man, that person is just doing great, and then they kill themselves. Or that person's doing great, and they die in a car wreck. That person's doing great, and they die in drug overdose. You know, this person's got tons of money, all this stuff, and then they die. You know, you think of Steve Jobs and, like, different people that are, like, billionaires, and then they have cancer and die. And, you know, I'm not here to, like, preach against Steve Jobs or anything like that besides the fact that his autocorrect sucks, you know? No, I'm just kidding, but it kind of does. Um, all that to say is that you look at these people and you say, well, man, they've lived a long life, but, man, they can go like that. They're gone, and they're gone for all eternity, okay? 
But if you want to have some promise here that God will be with you to prolong your days, and here's the, the key right here. You want to have an expected end. Okay? Talks about this in Jeremiah, and I might preach a whole sermon on this, to give us an expected end. Okay? Meaning that it's not just this uh, crazy uh, ending to your life. And I'm not saying that accidents can't happen or that if you have an accident or something happens, um, that, you know, uh, he won't, you know, that God can't be in that or, or whatever. Um, but in the end, I want to go out in a manner that's expected. Okay? I don't want to just be like, man, I didn't expect that to happen. And so all that to say is that I want you to see that, hey, this is the first command with promise. All those other commandments are just like, don't do this. This commandment's, uh, you know, do this. And if you do this, hey, I'm going to promise this to you, you know, a long life and that you may have long life on the earth and all that. Okay. So going on from there, go to uh, Exodus chapter 21. Because Jesus really mentions and couples these together. Okay, now when you're reading through Exodus 20, I know 21 came, comes right after, but you're not really thinking, honor thy father and mother, and then, you know, basically curse not your father and mother. Okay, but really what Jesus is doing in the New Testament is saying, listen, honor thy father and mother and not cursing your father and mother are pretty much the same commandment, right? It's basically stating that these things are linked. Okay, so if you're not honoring your father and mother, you know, it's kind of like if you don't, if you uh, don't love me, then you hate me kind of thing. It's kind of like a two-way street. Now, that, don't take that too far. You know, if, you're not, like, if you don't obey your mom or your dad, and that means you're cursing them. That's not what I'm saying. But it's kind of like this, this polar opposite view of it, right? If you're going this direction and trying to honor your father and mother, or you're going this direction, you're trying to curse them, okay? But you could be in the neutral area where you're just not doing anything, right? You're just not even listening to them at all, whatever. But in, in Exodus chapter 21, this is where Jesus is bringing this up because he's basically saying, and he that curses father and mother, let him die to death. Okay? Notice in Exodus 21 verse 17, it says, and he that curseth his father or his mother, surely, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, and he that curseth his, his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Okay? So it's not like Jesus just pulled this out of thin air. But he's also not negating it, right? Because people are like, oh, you know, in the New Testament, there's no death penalty. Then why did Jesus bring that up? You know, he that cursed his father and mother let him die to death. Why did he bring up the fact that if you offend one of these little ones, then you know, it's better for a millstone to be wrapped around your neck and cast into the sea? Uh, in other places as well, but at the same time, he's validating this commandment. He's validating that, hey, this is the way. It so it's either this. Either honor thy father and mother is done away in the New Testament, or you know, not cursing your father and mother lest you die to death is you know, in force. Does that make sense? You can't just say, well, honor thy father and mother still in there, but not curse thy father and mother, you know, and die to death. That's not in there. You can't just pick and choose. He literally put them together. He said, you know, that Moses or God commanded honor thy father and mother, and he that cursed his father and mother let him die to death. He put them two together. So you can't just pick and choose, and that's what people want to do, right? They want to look at the good stuff and be like, well, of course this still stays there, but, you know, we want to leave out Leviticus 20. We want to leave out Leviticus 18. We want to leave out the stuff that they don't want to hear about. Okay, Leviticus 20 and verse 9. Leviticus 20 and verse 9. Notice what it says. And it's, I'm just showing you, <coughs> these are you know, the same thing that's going on there, but just to kind of show you where Jesus is getting this from when he's quoting it you know, as far as God commanding it. And, and Leviticus 20 and verse 9, it says, For every one that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death, he hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. Proverbs 20.20 20 says this, Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. So this is serious, right? So <clears throat> you think about it, it has a promise, but it's kind of like that twofold promise of, you know, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And it's like there's a good and bad to that, right? Because you have he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So it's, it's really this two-way street as far as, hey, if you keep this commandment, you have this good promise that you can hold on to. But if you don't keep it and you go the other direction with it, right, then you have a promise of, like, destruction, okay? 
So you need to be thinking about that because when it says that you may have long days on the earth, what it's basically saying is if you do the opposite of honoring your father and mother, you might as well just start saying, I want God to take me out. You know, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he should pray for it. You know what that means? In that verse, it says, if a brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Who's it asking? It's basically saying, if you see a brother sin a sin which is not unto death, you need to ask. What does that mean? To pray. You know, for that person, you know, that's sinning that sin that's not unto death. But he said, if you sin a sin which is unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. Meaning that if someone sins, let's say someone kills someone in cold blood, you're not to pray for them to be acquitted and to get out of that. Does that make sense? If someone commits a crime that's worthy of death, you're not to be like, well, let me pray for that person so they get out of that punishment. That's, not, that's, that's the opposite of what it's saying. It's saying don't pray for that person. Okay. There it, it says all unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not unto death, meaning that not all sins are unto death. So, and then people are like, well, you know, when it's talking about it, it's just talking about the wages of sin is death. Then how do you answer all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death? Okay? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and, and, you know, for the wages of sin is death, but that's talking about a spiritual death. That's talking about death and hell. Obviously, any sin would send you to hell, but we're talking about capital punishment. Okay? And it's stating that if you sin a sin which is unto death, you're not supposed to be praying for that person to get out of that judgment. Okay? And this is very serious. So children and young ones, uh, teenagers, all that, know this, that you know what? It may not be a dictate in America right now, but God can take you out at any moment. You curse your father and mother. You know, what are you talking about? Well, you say, well, you know, I cussed them out. Well, that's bad, okay? But when it's talking about cursing your father and mother, that's talking about, like, telling them to go to hell. That's like saying, I want you to die. You know, that's saying, like, that's some really strong language. And listen, if anybody's guilty of that, you need to be asking for forgiveness from God and from your parents for ever saying anything like that. But that's some serious stuff right there. You say, well, they should, uh, you know, you're telling me that they should die to death? That's what the Bible says. And you know what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, which we just read? It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Meaning that if you had somebody... If you had like a teenager that like slapped their parents in the face and like cursed them and and you know call called the you know judgment upon them that they would like die or they would go to hell or anything like that and you executed that person guess what a lot of kids would see that a lot of teenagers would see that and they would not do it and I'm, I'm sick and tired of you know you know like President Obama when he was in office he was mocking the Bible and saying, well, you know, Leviticus, <laughs> you know, Leviticus says that if your children's disobedient, that you need to put them to death. Where does it say that? Cursing your father and mother is different than disobeying your father and mother. That's a big difference. Okay. Smiting your parents. Now, when it's talking about smiting, it's talking about like you're trying to maim them. You're trying to hurt them. Right. And. You know, a lot of times we're talking about smiting unto death, right? So if your child is, like, trying to physically hurt you and physically do something like that, the Bible will put a strict punishment on that. And these are the type of things that you need to know. And listen, you know, I know America's wicked and they don't follow God's laws, but you need to know that, hey, listen, God's still there, and this is the perfect law of liberty. And now I want to give you a case here because, you know, they always take it, things out of context. But let's look at the one place where... where, where um, uh, a son is being, you know, judged and that he's going to die, you know, he's going to be given capital punishment. And let's look at that story. Is this talking about a toddler? Okay? Because that's what they want you to think, right? When they bring this up, they want you to think, well, you know, what child doesn't disobey? We're talking, and they'll like think, well, you're, you're five-year-old over there, you're six-year-old, you're ten-year-old, you know, and like kids. They're, that's what they're talking about, right? Well, let's look at, you know, a passage where it actually talks about someone's son being put to death and let's see if this is a toddler let's see if this is like some young child here that is talking about here okay so in verse uh deuteronomy chapter 21 deuteronomy 21 and verse 18 deuteronomy 21 verse 18 deuteronomy 21 verse 18 and listen 
you know what? Maybe God will send she bears out of the woods. You know, it happened with Elisha. When they, the, the, remember the, the children, there were children that were mocking Elisha because he was bald, apparently. You know? It says, go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. It just sounds like some schoolyard thing, you know, right? Go up, thou bald head. Baldy, you know, like you just imagine like what would be said today, you know. But they're making fun of him, and he cursed them. Elisha, Elisha the prophet, and it says that she bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of them. So there's 42 children that were tore up by these bears. Now, it doesn't say that they died, but good night. You get some she bears coming out of the woods. So all that to say is that, you know what? There may not be a physical punishment by men here, but you never know what could come out of the woods. You're in West Virginia, okay? There's mountain lions here. I know that people don't think they're here, but they are. You know, they've actually found them on video. So, you know that, that verse where it says there's a lion without? That could be true. It may not be like Mufasa, but, you know, there's some mountain lions that are out there. Anyway, so here there in Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, it says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place. Now, so this is basically saying that you're chasing him, it's just not working. Now, I'll say this. You know what this is showing me? That they didn't do it at times. Okay? Because they didn't do it early. Now, you say, well, how do you know that this person isn't like a child here? You know, like they're, this is like a 10-year-old or something like that. Well, lo- let's look at this. And you decide for yourself when you read this if you think this is like a little child, okay? In verse 20, it says, And they shall say unto the elders of the city, so they're saying, you know, this is our son, right? This is our son. Our, this our son is stubborn and rebellious and will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard, okay? So unless your toddler is getting, you know, sloshed, you know, for... And listen, if, if, you're, if your child that's in your house is getting drunk, then you are the problem, Okay, what in the world? Okay, so he's basically a glutton, a drunkard, stubborn, rebellious, and it says, "And all the many men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear in fear." So, <clears throat> what do you have here? I think you have like a thirty-year-old living in their parents' basement and rebelling against their parents and won't leave and won't do what their parents say. And he's basically just eating everything that they have. He's, he's, a, he's a drunkard. And he just won't, he's just belligerent. They're chasing him, but he just won't do anything, right? The Bible says, take him out and stone him with stones. You don't have the city, take him out and stone him with stones. I don't see a little child here, okay? Because you know what you could do if you have a little child? You don't give him food. You don't, well, first of all, you don't give him alcohol, right? <laughs> so that's the first step there. But... You know what this, this is telling me is that you have someone that failed at chastening their child and they got to a point where chastening won't work, right? The rod is just not working with them. And that's why the Bible says that you need to do it at times and that means early, okay? You need to do it early because if you wait and you wait until they're a teenager, then it may not work, okay? So I believe you're dealing with uh, you know, an older person there, an older son. It doesn't say child there, by the way. It says son, okay? So I believe you're dealing with an adult age person, okay? Not someone that's an adolescent, okay? That you're dealing with when you're dealing with these type of things, okay? So go to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. And I want you to notice this, too, because you say, well, man, in our day, you know, there's all kinds of people that are disobeying their parents or cursing their father and mother. And it's true. We do live in that generation right now. But th- there's nothing new under the sun, okay? Meaning that this stuff was going on in times past. And I believe that sometimes it may skip a generation here or there in different countries, meaning that I do believe there's times where there's, the generation is pretty godly to where you don't have a lot of that. Now, you're always going to have that, right? Does that make sense? Like, you're never going to get rid of people not obeying or honoring their, uh, I mean, uh, cursing their father and mother. You're not going to get to where everybody's just honoring their father and mother and not one person. But as a whole, a generation that does it, okay? And I believe we're getting into a generation where it's just, 
basically kids just slapping their parents in the face and just not doing anything about it. You know what that comes down to? Not actually reading the Bible, not doing what God says, and just having this own plan in your mind to say, I know, what, you know what's best for my kid, and I don't need God to help me out with that. Okay. So in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 11, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 11, it says, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Man, it's just like reading the newspaper, isn't it? A bunch of social justice, virtue signaling morons that are out today that literally think that they're pure and they're holy, these holier than thou's that are going to go dictate you know, what we need to do, and the, 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 mor- the moral supremacy of these wicked people out there that are against the Bible. It's disgusting. But they're pure in their own eyes, right? In their mind, they're pure even though they're killing babies en masse, even though they, they support perversion and wickedness and pedophilia and all this other garbage that's out there. But in their mind, they're pure, and we're wicked, okay? But you know what? This isn't something new. This is something that's been going on since the beginning of time here. Notice what it says, There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There, there is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Go down to verse 17 there. Kind of going into the, the father and mother here. It says, verse 17, The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagle shall eat it. Wow. So, children, you want some fear? That verse right there. Okay? That if you're not, you know, that it, I mean, th- really, despise to obey his mother. That mocketh his father. He's basically saying, hey, listen, the ravens are going to pick out your eyes. I mean, that is strong language coming from the Bible. And you know what? You know what you should get is a little fear of God the next time that you think about saying something cross to your parents or anything like that. And listen, as adults, we need to think about that as well. We need to think about the fact that, hey, our parents still, uh, it's our duty to give them honor. Okay? It's not, we're not profiting them. We're not giving them a gift. We're not saying, hey, out of the goodness of my heart, I'm doing this. No, it is our duty. It's non-negotiable that we need to be honoring our parents and not despising them and not uh, you know, trying to curse them, obviously. So, But go to Isaiah chapter 3 because you know what? <clears throat> we, have a, we have a generation today, by and large, where children do not honor their mother and father. They despise their mother and father. They curse father and mother. They smite their father and mother. And you know what? It's the judgment of God. You know why this is happening? Because our country is forgetting God. And all nations that forget God shall be turned down into hell. You know what? That can be proverbially as well. Meaning that obviously if you forget God, you're going to die and go to hell. But if you forget God as a nation, listen, our nation is going to you know, basically, it's going to be hell on earth here. Okay, the judgment of God is going to come down on this country. And guess what? When you see this type of stuff that's going on, all you need to know is that, hey, this is the judgment of God. This is what our country deserves when you have this type of stuff going on. Now, in Isaiah chapter 3, I know we already went through this chapter on Wednesday, but it's been a little while. Verse 1 there says, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay in the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. The mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of fifty and the honorable man, and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent orator, and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Do you think that's a good thing? I don't think anybody would read that and be like, man, this is awesome. You know, they're just in for a treat. He just got rid of all their man of war, all their wise men and prudent men, all those that were skilled. And he said, I'm going to put children in charge. Notice what it says in verse 5. It says, And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. That's judgment from God. God's the one that did that. And so when you see that in America, you should say, Oh, this makes sense. When our country is killing babies by mass, when our country is, is promoting Wickedness, and not only promoting wickedness, but they're, they're basically punishing those that want to be righteous and that are speaking the truth. You know, the opposite of what the government is supposed to be doing, which is the punishment, <coughs> punishment of evildoers and the praise of them that do well. 
they're they're the punishment of the of them that do well, <clears throat> and they praise the wicked. So it's really backwards today, but you know what? You say, who do you blame? I blame parents. Because if you want your children to honor you, you have to teach them that. Okay? This is not something that a child is just going to innately know to do. Okay? Children come forth from the womb speaking lies. Okay? You have to teach them to tell the truth. Okay? And you need to teach them you know, to honor you as parents. You need to teach them these aspects. And if you want our country... If, if America wants our country to get back on track, you know what they need to do? They need to get saved, they need to get into the Bible, and they need to see what God says about raising children. And ultimately, you look at this commandment, you say, yeah, children, why aren't you honoring your father and mother? But you know what you should say, parents, why aren't you raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Because you know what? That should come first. And if you want your children to honor you when they get older, or as you're raising them, then you need to teach them, right? You need to... You need to discipline them the way the Bible says. Go to Proverbs chapter 13. <clears throat> we, our church is over 50% children. So we have a lot of children here. And so this is very pertinent to us. Now, obviously, children, you need to honor your father and mother. Okay? And even us as adults, you know, if we have our parents that are still alive, we need to honor our parents, right? But... We need to look at this as parents in this church, meaning that we there's, this church is filled with children, and a lot of the children are younger children, right? And they're in that age that, hey, this is the times, okay? And, you know, so we need to be in that aspect of saying, hey, we need to take care of this at the beginning to where this doesn't become an issue, okay? So in Proverbs 13, verse 24, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, and he, <clears throat> but he that loveth him chasteneth him but times. Now, I used to think that but times meant often, but it doesn't mean often, okay? It means early, okay? Early. You know, it talks about, you know, doing it early while there is hope, okay? Chasing them, chasing them while there is hope, okay? And that's where you get into that story in Deuteronomy where there came a point where there wasn't hope, right? It just wasn't working, and, you know, that's a tragedy. You don't want that to be the case with your child, do you? And the idea is that you need to do it while there is hope, while it's early, while they're young. And notice that it says, he that spareth, you notice that it doesn't say he that spareth his, <coughs> his rod spoileth his son. You know, you've heard that phrase, right? He that spareth the rod spoileth the child. No, it doesn't say that, does it? No, it says you hate them. Okay, that, I believe it. I believe that if you spare the rod, then you ultimately don't love your child. That means you hate them. Okay? You say, well, I don't hate them. You know, and I've heard parents say this. I've heard people say this before I ever had children. They say, you know, I'm never going to spank my child because I love them too much. That is completely opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible literally says the opposite of what just came out of your mouth. Right? It literally says that if you spare the rod, you hate them. But if you love them, you chasten them betimes. They're like, well, I'm not, I don't want to be their parent. I want to be their friend. And that's why they're going to curse you to, their, to your face when they're older. That's why they're going to disappoint you and bring you shame when you're older because you didn't actually give them chastening. The Lord loveth whom he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Are you better than God? Because God knows what, how to do it. So, and God is love. And listen, I preached a whole sermon about the fact that God cares, and Jesus cares, and how much he loves us, but yet he chastens us, he chastens us but times, doesn't he? Because he loves us, okay? So if you love your children, guess what? You're going to chasten them. It's not, always, it's not fun. No one likes spanking their children. No one likes punishing their children. No one takes pleasure in that. If you do, you're, you're a psychopath. No one enjoys it, okay? Now, you may have pleasure in the fact that, you know, they make you angry, and you just want, like, you know, like it talks about in Hebrews chapter 12, right? It says, they for their own pleasure chastened us for a season, right? Because you're just like, they make you so angry, you're just like, you're not getting that. You know, you're not getting this, and then they go pout about it and all that. But that's just your flesh, you know, basically, you know, wanting to somehow get revenge on them or something like that, which is not a good thing, by the way. You know, obviously, the good way is that all the chasing, because it says, but God, for, for your um, edification, Right? 
So it's basically stating, hey, that shouldn't be the case, right? As a parent, you should be doing it because you love them, you want them to get right, and you're not chasing them for your own pleasure as far as like you are getting what you deserve, you know? <laughs> you know you're getting punished and you know, giving you satisfaction because of that. But honestly, you know, no one, you'd rather your children did right, wouldn't you? No one would say, man, I'd rather, I'd want to punish them, right? I want them to have to go through this. No, you want them to do right and then just have a good time with them. But go to Proverbs chapter 22, here in Proverbs 13 there. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. And I could do a tour de force through the book of Proverbs when it comes to training your children. But I'll spare you that. Um, Really what I want you to get at here is the fact that you need to do it early. And if you love your children, you'll do it. But notice, here's the, here's the cause and effect, right? Here's, here's the if-then statement. If you train them early, it says in verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Okay? So, you need to understand that, hey, listen, we need to do this. We need to do this with our children. And if we want our children to honor us when we're older, right, when he is old... He will not depart from it, then you need to do it early, and you need to do it often. And it's funny, obviously my children are losing their minds as I'm preaching this sermon. But, uh, but all I'd say is that, you know, when they're young and at this age, you're in survival mode, case in point. Okay? Survival mode when they're toddlers, and no one likes the chastening process. No one likes that. You'd rather just let it go. You'd rather give in to their request. But you know what? You know what you should realize here is that toddlers are implacable. Okay, this is my whole point. Toddlers are implacable. It doesn't matter what you give them. They want more, and they're never satisfied. So if you get that down, then you'll realize that, hey, it doesn't matter if I give them what they want. The next time it's going to be more. So you know what you need to do? Stand your ground. Okay? If you say you're going to do something, you do it. When it comes to disciplining and when it comes to saying, hey, I'm not going to give you that, you got to stick to it. So be careful, and I'm saying this to parents, be careful what you threaten your children with, okay? Because you don't want to be like, listen, you're never going there again. We've all done it, okay? We're never coming back here again, and then you go back there next week, okay? So you need to be careful on this because you need to know, they need to know that you're a person of their word, right? Because when, when you use that type of, like, we're never going to do this again, we're never going to do that, You'll never do this again, or you know whatever it may be. You're never going to eat that again, and then they eat it the next day, or they do that the next day, or they do that the next week. You know they're going to think, well, those are idle threats. So what you need to learn to do, and we all learn this, okay, as parents, you need to learn that when you threaten something, you have to be willing to follow through on it. So if you say, listen, you're not doing this tonight. You know, tonight you're not getting a bedtime snack, whatever it is. I'm just using that as an example. You're not going to, you know, do this or whatever it may be. You know, you better be good or next time. And let's say, let's say they, they fight you tooth and nail about it and they're upset about it. You hold to your guns that whole night. And you, and you do that to the point where they realize, hey, he's not messing around. Okay. But if you, if you constantly say, hey, you'll never do this again, and then you do it the next day, they're just going to be like, well, pff, that's not really true. You know, he's just saying it. Okay? And I'm just saying this as a parent. You live and learn when it comes to this, right, as far as that goes. So, um, but we need to remember this, you know, and you can turn there if you want, but Ephesians chapter 6, you know, we read the verses about the children obeying the parents, but also the idea that it says in verse 4, it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20, Children, obey your parents in, in, in all things, for this is uh, well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So this is a fine line because obviously you need to discipline, but you also don't want to, them to hate you, okay? I mean, I mean, you can go too far with discipline to where they just think that you're just doing it, uh, you know, like there's no profit to them. It's not because you love them. So anytime you're chasing and doing that, you need to have that nurture and admonition that's there, right? And when, when you're dealing with like a two-year-old, there's not much admonition because they, you can't reason with a two-year-old, okay? So uh, any of you that, that are about to have toddlers or you're going to have kids one day, there's no reasoning with toddlers, okay? You, you don't talk to them like a normal person. Be like, 
and a rationalized thing. There's no rationale, right? And so when it comes to disciplining, what you really need to show them, though, is that you care about them, okay? You're tender with them. And especially I have girls, so you got to be tender with girls and all that stuff as far as, um, you know, strict with the punishment. But at the same time, you know, you're not dealing with a dog. You're dealing with your child. You're dealing with, um, you know, uh, a sensitive human being with a lot of emotions. <laughs> you know, when it comes to girls, that's definitely true. But all that to say is that, that don't forget that, okay, when it comes to the chastening aspect. It's not all spanking, okay? That's a part of it. Okay, don't leave that out. But at the same time, the other part is the nurture part part of it. Okay, and you know, and not provoking them to anger and discouraging them, right? And you know, you learn this with children. You say, well, what's your, what's your whole point with this? Because your children will remember this. Okay, if you want your children to love you and honor you when you're later in life, they need to know that you cared about them when you raised them and when you disciplined them. Okay. And children will realize that, hey, you were disciplining them because you wanted them to turn out right. Later on, they really see that. They may not see it at the beginning, and they'll just think that you're just being mean. Okay? But later on, they'll say, hey, you know, I'm glad you did that, so I didn't t- turn out to be some horrible person. Okay? But they'll also remember if you were really mean about it, if you were nasty about it, or if you were loving and caring about it. Okay? And so you need to remember these type of things because you don't want them to grow up to hate you because you did that. You want them to grow up and love you because you did that. And so we need to remember that. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> and what I'm finding with this generation, you know, we've gone out soul winning for quite a while now. You know, when we, you know, just, uh, you know, past decade or so of like just, uh, you know, Emmanuel Baptist Church. We were going out soul winning, all this stuff. And I went out soul winning before that. And we kept running into people, and they're like, yeah, I grew up in church. You know, I, I'm not going to church right now, but I grew up in church. You know what we're running into now? Never went to church. Man, how the tides have turned. And so you get that aspect. It's just, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. To now, we're at an explain, you know, everything, right? They don't even know that Jesus rose from the dead. And they don't know any of the stories. You talk about Jonah, they're like, what are you talking about? Joan of Arc? What? You know, like, they think that Joan of Arc is like Noah's wife or something like that. And it's funny, but it's true, okay? Now, that being said, you know, people just are completely ignorant of the Bible now. But you know why it is? Is because their parents didn't go to church, okay? You know, when I was in college, it was like, is like, well, you know, I went to church when I was back at home, but I'm not going to church out here. You know, I, I grew up in church, but I'm not going there now. Well, now there's another generation coming along where those kids that, those kids that were in college that grew up in church but didn't go to church are now raising kids where they're not going to church at all. Okay? And what's the point here? Is that we need to teach our children the Bible. We need to teach them, you know, the Word of God. And obviously that's where church comes in too. But listen, as parents, we need to be the ones that are teaching them this. Okay? Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6, it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. You know what that saying is that, listen, when you're at home and when you're with your children, you need to be teaching them the word of God. Throughout the day. And it's saying you even have it written on your doorposts. Right? Meaning that it's, it's just known that, hey, the Bible is, is our authority. This is where we get what we believe. And what I find in a lot of churches is the fact that you say, well, how do we keep the young children in church? You know, the, the younger generation in church. That's interesting because our church is the younger generation. Okay? But it's, it's a gen- younger generation that care about the things of God because they looked at it themselves. They actually read it themselves. They actually believe it for themselves. They weren't just dictated it, but not shown where it came from. Okay? And there's a lot of you know, we, we, I've gone to churches where as soon as that 18th birthday, they, get, they, get, they graduated from high school and you never see them again. How many of those have we seen in churches where it's like they graduate and be like, we're probably never going to see them again? 
and they all go to Faith Baptist. <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that little stab in there, but it is true. It is true. That is like the, the Faith Baptist, and you say, you say, I can't believe you say that about, about them, but you know what? They weren't King James only. You know, they're not soul winning. You know what? I don't even know where they stand on the repentance issue, but you know what? That's where everybody goes when they don't want to serve God, it seems like. And you'd be like, oh, I can't believe you'd say that. Well, you know, sue me. But it, it's just, I'm just speaking facts here. Because I don't see Faith Baptist just tearing up the streets with soul winning. And maybe, you just proved me wrong. You know what? I'd love for Faith Baptist Church in, in uh, Morgantown to prove me wrong and start winning people to Christ and start preaching out of the King James Bible and actually preach hard against sin one, one day instead of having a whole sermon about the Titanic and about Abraham Lincoln. Okay? And you know what? you see in those churches, though, is that they're taught standards, but they're never taught why. They're never taught, you know, this, thus saith the Lord. And, you know, they say, well, why should I wear a dress? Well, why don't you read Deuteronomy 22.5 when it says that if you wear a, a man's garment, it's an abomination. And you say, well, that doesn't say a dress. Well, you better figure out what that is then because you don't want to be an abomination. Okay? But they don't teach that. They just say, well, you know, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't have a beard. You shouldn't have this hair length. And it's nothing in the Bible that's saying these certain things that they're saying, right? And then children, when they grow up, graduate, they're like, well, what? You know, that's just what my parents taught. Okay? And it's good to have standards in your home, but you better be showing them verse, uh, you know, verse after verse, line upon line, precept after precept. You should be showing them this is why we believe this. You know, you should say, well, why do we believe that someone needs the word of God to be saved? Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Because being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And it's baffling to me, all these Baptist churches that are now saying, you don't even need the word of God to be saved. And people are coming out of those churches and they're leaving. They're like, oh, you don't really need the word of God to be saved. You know why? Because they were never taught those verses. And they didn't actually believe it for themselves. Now, when children are in our house and they're young and they're toddlers, listen, I'm not saying you're going to teach them all that at once right there, okay? But as you're going through life, you should be saying, you know, to my daughters, I'm going to be saying, listen. You know, you say, well, why, why are all these other girls over here wearing pants? And why are they all wearing, you know, short shorts and doing all these different things? And we're always in dresses. You're like, well, this verse right here says that it's an abomination to wear men's clothing and, it's an, and we're not to be naked, Here's where it says, this is where the nakedness from the loins to the thighs. Okay? So that's why you don't wear short shorts. And that's why I don't wear short shorts. Praise God. But, you know, why do they wear a dress? You know, because it's hard to be modest in britches. And listen, if you wear britches, ladies, that are not uh, skin tight, guess what it looks like? A man's pair of garments. Right? But if you wear it skin tight, guess what? Now I can see every curve of your body and now it's not modest if you want to have that argument. But you need to bring this stuff up to them and you say, thus said the Lord, it's an abomination. You better figure out what that is. Because this isn't me saying you're an abomination. This is God saying that you're an abomination. And you know what? Children need to know this when they're growing up. They need to know it early. They need to know it at times so that when they're like 18 years old, they're not just getting this overload of information. They'll be like, well, why didn't you tell me this when I was younger? You know, they need to be preaching on sin hard about fornication, about uncleanness, about all the different stuff that could be going on in the world because when they turn 18, they don't need to hear it just then because at that point, it's probably too late. And, you know, it, that, that, that's what I see. And listen, the proof will be in the pudding, okay? Because our church is filled with children that are at different ages, and we're getting, we have teenagers, and we have adults, and, you know, that are getting into young adult age, but by and large, we have a lot of toddlers, okay? I don't know what our medium age is, but it's pretty low, okay? <laughs> Meaning that we're probably in, like, the 10-year-old range when it comes to median age and counting all the adults, okay? And that's a good thing, right? You know what that means is that we have, we have a thriving young church that is, you know, the next generation that's going to come up. But you know what? The proof will be in the pudding if our parents in this church will teach them these precepts, teach them from the Bible, this is why we do this. And you know what will happen when you do that? Listen, you can't, you can't say that it's going to be foolproof. You can't control what your kids do after they leave the house. But in the end, it says, train up a child in the way he should, he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
But you can't just say, well, I told them everything they should do. No, it should be, thus said the Lord. It should be the word of God. Because it talks about these commandments and these precepts. You need to teach them to them when, when thou liest down, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou risest up. You know, you need to be doing this throughout your life. Okay, this isn't just Sunday teaching here. Okay, this isn't just Wednesday teaching. This is, you know, when you're at home, wherever you're at. And listen, your children will have questions. Be like, well, why do we do this? Do you have a reason? Do you have a biblical reason? Or are you just going to be saying, well, because I said so. Now, listen, there are times where it's going to be because I said so. Okay? Because, like I said, you're not going to be able to explain some of this stuff to a two-year-old. Okay? You're like, well, why do we do this? And you know, you know that, that age where everything's why anyway. Right? You're like, you get to that point, you'd be like, no more whys. It just is what it is. You'd be like, why is the sky blue? You know, why is this? You know? And uh, anyway, so go to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Because this is what you want, right? You want your children to honor you when, you're, you know, when they grow up. And we need to honor our parents as well. But as you're turning there, Proverbs 15, verse 20 says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish, son, a foolish man despises his mother. Okay? So what, how do you get to the point where you're glad at your children? When they're wise. Listen, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You, you want me to be happy with my children? I want them to get saved and love the Lord. Mission accomplished. That's all. I don't care what they do with their life. Besides that, you know, and if I have sons, I don't care what kind of job they have as long as they, they love the Lord, they, they're saved and they love the Lord and they're serving Him. I don't care if they clean toilets for the rest of their lives. You know, whatever they do... As long as they get saved and love the Lord and serve Him, that's all that matters to me, and I'll be as happy as a clam. I don't even know what that means, but I've heard it before. Okay? So, but in Proverbs 31, verse 28, it says, Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. So, you know, the virtuous woman, you know what she did? She took care of her family. She'd get up before it was, it was light out. She made sure they had food, made sure they had raiment, and took care of her family. And you know what? You know what her children do now? You know, basically saying that they rise up. What does that mean? They sit up when she comes in the room. They stand up in her presence and say she's blessed. And you know what? That doesn't just come automatically. And if you want your children to honor you, and and listen, if you want your children to live long on the earth, then you want them to honor you, right? Because that's a commandment. That's basically saying, hey, if you want long life on the earth for, their, you know, for the children, they need to honor you. And how do you get them to honor you? By teaching them the word of God at a young age, by disciplining them at a young age, and getting them to love the Lord. Okay? And so, you know, obviously as, as adults, we need to remember this with our parents. Um, and, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, some of you, you know, some parents have passed away. And so that's obviously not... Uh, something that you can do now, but at the same time, you know, a lot of us do have our parents that are still here, and we should honor them as much as possible, and it's not, it's not just, you know, hey, you know, I'm doing this above and beyond. No, that's duty to honor your parents, okay? Honor your father and mother, and that's the fifth commandment of uh, the Ten Commandments, and so um, it's a great commandment to remember, and obviously Jesus brought it up. It's brought up many times in the New Testament. And so it's obviously still something we should do. I don't think anybody, does anybody ever like doubt that? Does anyone say, hey, honor thy father and mother. That's, that's done away. Don't bring, bring me under the law, brother. You know? I don't think anybody's ever said that. So, you know, but you never know. There's weird stuff out there in the world. So <laughs> let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. And thank you for your word. And Lord, just help us to honor our parents. Help us to raise our children and the nurture and admonition of the Lord to where they will honor us when we're older and so that they will not depart from you, Lord. And that, uh, Lord, just the, the, my biggest prayer is that my kids get saved at a young age, that they start loving you and serving you, and that they do that for the rest of their life. And if that's all they do with their life, then that is a mission accomplished. Lord, just pray that you'd help that to happen with all our children in this church. And Lord, help us to be the leaders in our families and help us to be the parents we need to be for that to happen. And Lord, we love you. Pray all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.